Hi, everyone, and welcome to Empowering Homeschool Conversations. My name is Peggy Ployer. I am the founder and CEO of Sped Homeschool, as well as the host of this program, Empowering Homeschool Conversations. We're so excited that you're here with us this morning. I know I said this morning, this is not a typical time when we broadcast. And so I hope that some of you just in your normal breakfast routine or getting ready, pop us on and, uh, and join us for this conversation. This month of October here in 2022, we're talking about technology and maybe not technology in the aspect that um, you're used to talking about technology and education. Um, a lot of times we focus on tech being kind of the teacher of your student, where we know sometimes when you have a student that struggles, technology may be something that they love, but it may not be the best avenue to use in educating your students. So we want to just kind of cover some topics that'll help you learn how to use technology in a um, just in a very thoughtful way in using it in educating your student who has some unique learning needs, which is what we focus on here in um, on this show. So um, just so you know that um, this broadcast is put on by SPED Homeschool, and it's sponsored by viewers like you. If you'd like to make a tax-deductible donation to SPED Homeschool, you can visit our website at spedhomeschool.com. And also know that on our website at SPED Homeschool, we're focusing on this topic as well as in our blogs. So um, those are also written by various experts, and we've got an expert here today to sh share with us live. And um Rebecca, Roland, thank you so much for joining us this morning to talk about motivating our students using technology and probably some ways that our parents aren't used to approaching this topic. So thank you so much for joining us. Definitely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And also, I see viewers are already popping on. If you want to make comments, um, ask questions as we're going through this, um, just know that you can um, put your question comments in the feed, whether you're watching on YouTube or on Facebook, and we will will respond to those as we are we're talking this morning. I know a lot of you are probably giving your kids breakfast, um, so so just know that you can just put us on in the background too and listen live. Um, we are so happy that you're you're joining us. Do know that if you make a comment in the Facebook group, that's our support group there on Facebook, that you have to give permission to StreamYard in order to publish your, your comment because that is a private group that we run just for parents. Um, so, so, so excited. Um, Rebecca, I would love to just start this conversation by having you introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you and um, why you're just so passionate about motivating students and a, a little bit about what got you started in um, in doing the work that you do. And also you wrote a book. And so um, a little bit about that as well and what motivated that project. Sure, yeah. So my name is Rebecca Rowland and I actually am the mom of two kids. So I have a five-year-old and a 10-year-old. So I'm right awesome. in the thick of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm also a speech language pathologist. So I work with kids who have any kind of communication difficulties whether it's speech, but also trouble using language socially, yeah. um, trouble understanding what they read. So I do a lot of work with oral language, but also with mm. writing and literacy. Um, and I teach at the Harvard Grad School of Education. And I've also worked as a speech pathologist at Children's Hospital Boston. And there mm. we really work to diagnose kids with learning disabilities. So I really have that whole clinical right. background, but also research. Um, mm -hmm. and yes, and I, I recently wrote a book kind of combining all of these things. It's a partly a memoir of my own mm. journey raising my kids, but also thinking about the research on how can we have conversations that are motivating to kids that do help them learn. Right. And bond. So yeah, that's, mm. that's when where all that's come from. That's awesome because that learning and bonding, I don't think many people understand how important that is, that if you don't have that relationship, the learning doesn't translate as easily. And so I love that you talk about that. And we are going to talk about that a lot today. So if that intrigues you, definitely stay in tune because this is not a, we're not going to talk about technology as disintegrated, but as integrated into that relationship bond that is so important in learning. Um, so, so I love that you touch on that. And, um, 
And yes, that that's a, a great segue into um, some of the questions we're going to talk about. And um, so I would love for you just to start talking about motivation, though, first, because a lot of parents, we we know they ask this all the time in our support groups. And um, when we get phone calls is my child just doesn't want to learn. Mm-hmm. And so what what is the basis a lot of times behind that dismotivation or unmotivated students, because a lot of times we've heard from experts, kids want to learn, yet we see these kids that don't want to learn. And so what's going on here? Yes, definitely. And I've seen that a lot. So a lot of times I've seen kids after years of having trouble with motivation and feeling as if, oh, they're in Mm -hmm. sort of a cycle of not wanting to learn and not learning. And then it kind of creates more not wanting to learn. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that that's one big thing is that if kids have experienced a lot of senses of failure or not mastering a subject or not being in control, a lot of times it does create that cycle where they're Hmm. like, oh, I can't do it. Why should I try? Or it's too easy. It's too hard. Or I don't understand. Um, So starting to kind of pull back and see, well, what's behind that lack of motivation? Mm. And starting with Mm -hmm. questions, I think is so important. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of a learned behavior. Mm-hmm. So naturally motivation should be something a child has that they want to learn, but, but it's, yes, we. Yeah. So we often think about it. Um, there's a lot of research on the idea of mastery. So, and competence. Mm-hmm. so if a child feels like, Oh, I'm mastering something and I have mm-hmm. some kind of competence, it might not be total competence, but they're mm-hmm. kind of getting their way towards the goal or they're learning, you know, in a way that feels good. And they right. want to do more of it. Um, mm. That's especially true with reading, I think. So a lot of times kids who are having early success with reading, it's exciting mm-hmm. to them because they feel like, oh, now I'm, I'm reading more words. I understand more. Yeah. I can kind of progress. And mm-hmm. if they're not, if they're whatever, for whatever reason, it can start hmm. to feel demotivating. Like, oh, this is right. hard and I'm not getting it. So especially for kids who are having those struggles, to sort of pick apart, well, where is that struggle coming from? And mm-hmm. how to make changes, I think, is so important to help them feel like, oh, I can master something and can have some success. Right. So the motivation or the reward actually comes within the learning itself versus an external motivator that we have to add on. Exactly. Um, yeah. I often think about, you know, helping children see their own progress as motivation mm-hmm. in itself. Like create, even if some kids benefit from like, you know, a visual chart to say, well, let's, you can make your goal. Like, let's see how far you can progress towards that. Right. I do think giving kind of an external reward, it often, it kind of actually can be counterproductive sometimes because it can feel like, um, oh, well, if I'm doing this, it must not be fun because why would I need a reward? (laughs) If I have to eat my broccoli, then it's it's not good. If I get ice cream afterwards, because it's, you know, the broccoli must be bad. Um, Right. Same thing. Hmm. Well, and it's not a long lasting motivator either, because as we become adults, we don't have somebody to give us those prizes exactly. um, to keep reading. Mm-hmm. Um, the reading itself should be what motivates us and exactly. or whatever else that we do. And so that's a really good point that um, we want to move towards that. If um, maybe if we're already in an external motivation setting with our child yeah. and 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 then the underlying cause of what what may be causing it is just they don't have the mastery or they don't have the precursor to what they need to be successful. So, so that's, yeah, yeah. that's some great points. Yeah. Do you have something else to add to that? Oh, yeah. I, yeah. Sorry. I did also want to think about just um, opening up kind of the way sometimes the subject matter or the way kids are allowed to learn. So sometimes mm-hmm. I've had kids, for example, you know, where a parent or a teacher will say, Oh, you know, I don't want them reading graphic novels because Oh, that's not, you know, there's not very much text. I'd rather that they do hmm. something with more text. But if the right. child is, if that's what's engaging to the child at this moment, hmm. especially if they're, you know, they are having some motivation trouble, I do right. think about kind of opening it up and saying, well, yeah, you could read about cars if you like cars or read about graphics, mm-hmm. you know, kind of really tailoring it to a child, I think is also key. Yes, yes. Good. Diving into those areas of interest. And we have such a freedom in homeschooling to do that. And exactly. so so embrace that parents that um, that can that can lead to some great motivation. If um, if you kind of let go. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I know that's hard. Um, 
but but allowing your kids to just explore and use those skills that we want them to build on in a way that really is catered to their uniqueness. So yes, awesome. Love that. Um, so children have a natural curiosity and I know that um, it drives them to use a lot of technology, probably use a lot of technology better than we do. I know my daughter was just, we were at the chiropractor and they had this brand new um, massage chair that my chiropractor said, well, why don't you go sit in the chair for 10 minutes while I adjust your mom? And my daughter's 18, but you know, she, she just sent her off. She goes, you probably will figure out in, in less than a minute. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. and, and so they kids just gravitate towards these technology things and they just naturally get them. Um, and, and so, you know, we don't want to discourage that. Um, so, so in that process, how do we integrate motivation um, in a way that we can engage some of these tech things into into being motivators that move into what we were talking about earlier was that, that intrinsic motivation. Definitely. Yeah. So there's a couple of key things I think about. So I, I definitely agree that I don't like to consider technology as quote unquote bad or good. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's really all about how kids are using it and how we can help them learn and feel motivated through right. using it. Um, so I think about two main things is one is just how active are they with the technology? Mm -hmm. So is it oh, more, yeah. so first is like, you know, you're, you're scrolling on TikTok or something. It'd be very passive um, mm. versus, you know, are you building something on Minecraft? Are you, right. you know, really exploring that kind of thing? So that's kind of that moving kids towards more active uses, kind of nudging mm. them in that direction. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important. Um, and then the second is how interactive is it? So right. actually, are they are they collaborating with other people? You know, are they working mm. with working with you and you're both on you know playing a game together or right. with their friends or you know other other kids in their group? Um, or is it something that's very um, solitary that doesn't have that interactive component? So I think yeah. if you can move kids in both of those directions, it's a big mm -hmm. start towards helping. That's some great things to point out because I don't think we often think about those things as we're thinking about education. We think about, you know, just, you know, what is, what are the outcomes? What are, you know, but that, that interaction, that back and forth is, is so important. And I mean, we know that, that, you know, we remember things that we've had relation that have been in a relationship context. Um, but yet we forget it very quickly when we think this technology is going to solve all our problems. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we just tend to disassociate all of that um, instead of saying, Oh, this, this should make sense that we, we need that, that interaction, that component to, to make it a long lasting um, effect in teaching our students. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do see so much focus just on, you know, number hours of screen time or, you know, mm. how much is my child? How much, how can I shut off technology or, and I do right. think we can have sort of a more nuanced conversation. Yeah. That, that's a really, it brings up a really good point is that, you know, technology used correctly shouldn't be something that we are trying. I mean, we don't get rid of technology just because it's bad. Mm -hmm. um, we don't, you know, add in just, things that are non-tech because they're good. Um, non-tech things can be bad as well if we don't use them properly. Uh, so, so yeah, it's just all how we, we integrate that and use it. Um, so, so now <laughs> how do we engage in that conversation, that relationship um, instead of relying solely on tech to motivate the child? Um, do you have some um, ways that, that parents can kind of move even from things that they are using right now um, to use it more effectively with that, that engagement um, aspect to it? Definitely, yeah. So I even think to take whatever kids are doing, say even today, and to think about 
well, what's a more interactive version of that um, would hmm. be one thing. So are they playing like a, a building video game? Is there a way they could play with friends, you know, and they could all sit around and look at the same thing? Mm. Or are they, if they're doing something more learning oriented, obviously, are they reading a book, um, you know, using something online? Could they do something where they respond online to, you know, a group of people having a discussion about that book? Or could mm. they upload a book mm -hmm. report and get feedback on it um, in that way? So always thinking about, well, how can we take what we're already doing and mm. kind of explore how it could become more collaborative, how we could get feedback and see online as a community of people, um, you know, rather than saying, okay, well, you're just yeah. going to do this thing online and then it's done. Um, mm -hmm. I do think a lot of kids love that sense of, you know, they're actually sharing their work with yes. people, people they don't yeah. know. So, you know, could mm -hmm. they make a blog about it or could they, something like that um, is one way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it's kind of that personalized version of social media. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. you know, we want to share. We want people to appreciate what we do. And and so he has to find those avenues, those safe places, not just like publish them out on social media, but, you know, within the context of those programs and those services to to start cultivating that. And I think that that makes a you know I'm just in the back of my mind popped, <laughs> um, you know that teaches them also how to be responsible in those sharing types of situations exactly. as and so you as a parent can come in and say well would you really want to say this do you really want people to read that you know let's let's edit this before we share it, um, and so so that kind of moves us into you know as a parent what engagement or how do we start building in the conversations and the questions that we can use with this technology that we're using um, to really help motivate our students to do even more? Yes. And I think a lot of it is about just how to raise children's self-awareness about technology. Hmm. So knowing that, you know, whatever age they are, they're going towards more independence. So as they get older, we won't always be over their shoulder, you know, looking at their right. how, what they're looking at. or So it's really important that we help raise their self-awareness. So as mm. they become more independent, you know, they're able to say, well, I'm going to make this choice because I can be critical about this or I can right. you know, notice what's working well for me and what's making me upset or what mm. seems to be safe and not safe. Mm -hmm. um, so I think having those kind of conversations, for example, asking a child, you know, well, let's think about like what aspect of that project felt to you engaging? What was the most fun? Um, where did you feel yeah. like you wanted to share? Where did you feel uncomfortable? Where did it challenge you? Um, hmm. What did you think we didn't go so well? You know, even those kind of evaluation type of questions um, yeah. would be really helpful. Yeah, it's you know, like the who, what, when, where, why, how, exactly. you know, yeah. I'm thinking, you know, as as the non-creative parent, um, <laughs> what questions do I ask? <laughs> right, right, exactly, yes. Yeah, and I think that that's the kind of thing, I, I actually, in my book, I talk all about, I have all these sections of question starters and conversation starters and things. Um, yeah, it's, you know, if you want to go further into that, but for sure, there's a lot of questions mm -hmm. about um, asking kind of what worked well for you, what didn't work well, what might we try the next time? So actually yeah. planning with your child, you know, what can we do again in the future? And that really gives them more agency too, because it feels like, okay, mm. well, I have a choice in what I'm doing. And right. we know that that's really key in motivation is having mm. students feel like, oh, I have some choice within bounds, but, you know, it makes, I'm allowed to actually kind of chart my own path too. Right. Yeah. Let's dive into that choice um, just a bit with technology. Um do you have any suggestions for parents, you know, as far as, you know, giving their students choice in, in those, those different, I guess, tech choice or technologies um, and, and how to kind of go about that? Yeah, so I definitely think that, um, that students really do know a ton about technology already. So <laughs> yes. obviously... <laughs> So if they can actually, sometimes even I as a parent, you know, will say, well, can you walk me through this? I'm not totally sure uh, that I get all of this. You know, you're playing mm -hmm. this robot, you're playing this thing or doing this online. I'm not right. sure how I feel about it right now because mm -hmm. I don't actually know mm -hmm. that much about it. So why don't you yeah. walk me through it? 
tell me mm -hmm. why you like it or what, you know, what is going well for you in this. And then mm -hmm. let's talk about like how, how this fits within your plans for education or how this fits within your time, uh, whether it's educational or whether it's something when you're doing on your own free time, that's not mm -hmm. educational. It's still so important to have children feel like, okay, well, this parent is on my side. Like they want to yes. understand. Um, and I think if you can start from that perspective of, you know, my parent is interested in what I'm doing and is not necessarily mm -hmm. opposed just because it's technology. I think so many right. times students will get that sense of, oh, well, my parent sees technology and they think, oh no, you're not doing that. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, which I understand. I feel like mm -hmm. that's there with the screen time. Um, but I think <laughs> if, if we can say, you know, well, we do want to understand there is a difference between mm -hmm. this thing and that thing, you know. Um, right. And, and I think that also gives a child uh, the chance to verbalize a lot and actually explain and teach, mm -hmm. um, which is also really important for their language development. So it kind of goes oh, yeah. in different ways. Yes, yes, exactly. And, you know, like I was talking about earlier is they're they are just so much more in tune with how these things work. And, um, and yes, it's very easy for us to say, you know, I don't know anything about that. So it just can't be good. Um, but being open to allowing them to teach you and show you, um, and then, you know, trying to, to figure out how can we make this work? Um, so that because I mean, education is, is really a partnership with your child mm -hmm. and, and you want to empower them as much as possible to, to advocate for themselves. Basically, why do you want to use this technology? Well, exactly. prove it to me. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> what a yeah. great yeah. skill. Yes. Yeah. Being able to actually create that argument, I think is, mm -hmm. is amazing. So I think if children are able to do that and do that effectively, um, yeah, yeah. So build their skills in so many different areas. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And I've also even when my kids have had different, we've we've needed technology. I've sent them out as as they're older, you know, and I know that they can go search the internet safely. Um, find something that works, mm -hmm. and I want you to research yeah. it, and and then tell me why this is going to work for you versus mm -hmm. all the other stuff you saw. Right. And and so then they're learning research skills as well, and they're learning how to compare one technology to exactly. another. And as technology changes all the time, that is such an important skill. For sure. Mm -hmm. That's great. And even thinking about sort of price and, you know, budgeting, like it just, it has a yes. lot to do with that. Mm -hmm. Yes. So true. Yes. And as they get older, even, you know, a lot of the high school type of materials, a lot of them are very tech integrated. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and so to, to have your student review that, you know, is this something you would enjoy? You know, right. this is, there's so much video, there's right. so much, you know, exactly. AI, AI built in. Mm -hmm. My daughter hated AI. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so mm -hmm. we, we learn that though, through the process of trial and error, mm -hmm. um, but you just don't know. And then they know something more about themselves too, that they can take into the work atmosphere versus just saying, well, I just did what my mom told me right. and, you know, and now, now I'm ready to launch into the world or go into college and I have no idea. Well, college exactly. tends to be exactly. that way too, is, you know, you're given stuff by your professors and you don't really know. Um, but if you, if your child has that background of, oh, well, maybe, you know, I have to do a PowerPoint presentation. Maybe I don't have to use PowerPoint. Maybe I can use Canva or, you know, all these other things that have these presentation things built into them. Um, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's such a great point that really even the same technology won't work well for the same two people in a family, you know, to mm. it's so personalized and finding your style and kind of why something doesn't work, you know, to say, well, is it AI right. is it because it was this reason or that reason and actually trying to figure that out can be mm -hmm. so helpful because when there's, you know, obviously technology is always changing. So if a student gets to a new technology, they look over it and they say, oh, this, this might work for me because I liked this other thing that happened in the other technology. Right. You know, they're able to start making those connections or to say, mm -hmm. oh, I don't think that's going to work because I tried something like that and I really didn't like it. Um, mm -hmm. So to, to actually be able to be kind of self-aware um, can help save a ton of time in the future if they are wading through you know, tons and tons of options. Right. Time and money as well. And money. Yeah. Yes, exactly. mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then being the parent 
that then can walk them also through those questions. Cause I think when they're younger, this would be a good thing to start working alongside your student mm-hmm, exactly. and asking those questions versus, you know, just sending them out on their own and saying, okay, oh, yeah, just- <laughs> for sure. I think, yes, you definitely need a lot of handholding at the, the mm-hmm. earlier ages. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So, yeah. And if you're watching live, I know we have some viewers and um, just feel free to pop in your comments and your questions. Um, we would love to include them in our, our conversation as well. Um, so, Talking about questions specific to motivation, how would a parent, you know, work in conversations that would empower their student with technology? Yeah, so I think it it does really go back to that question of interest and sense of mastery and control. So first Mm. is, you know, well, what kind of things are you drawn to? Um, that you think technology could help you explore. Oh, so, yes. you know, is it, say, they're, they're really good at rock climbing and they think like, mm. oh, it'd be really, we could do something with geography and figuring out, you know, where mm-hmm. are good rock climbing locations across the oh, United yeah. States or, mm-hmm. you know, or just so start to use their interest as a jumping off point for mm. kind of these technological mm-hmm. journeys. Or if they're, you know, right. they're really interested in graphic novels, like, well, let's see if we could research, you know, are there any interactive graphic novels that you could, you know, mm-hmm. see mm-hmm. online or do you want to create one and how would you go about doing that? Um, oh, yeah. That kind of thing. So really moving towards thinking of kids less as sort of passive recipients, but really as active creators as much as possible. Mm-hmm. You know, so you see like, oh, or you're, you're able to take what you learn and then apply it in some more um, extension or some way that actually does support your learning and application of the skills. And oftentimes that can be technology, um, even if the initial thing wasn't technology. So kind of using technology as a fun way to extend Mm. what children are already doing, uh, that can be a really great way to move forward. Yeah, I love that because, yes, we, it's often so so separate, you know, like this is school, this is, this is what you're interested in, or, you know, this is technology, which is usually gaming, Mm -hmm. um, at least in my house. (laughs) And, and then there's, there's, you know, whatever you have to find so you can find Mm -hmm. it, but, but let's mesh all this together. And, and as a parent, I can come in and coach you and, and really show you how to weave this together. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And I think recognizing that that will benefit probably their education side, but even benefit them deepening their interests. So kind of, you know, then they learn more about, you know, rock right. climbing and they want to do something else. So kind of, it kind of really does go mm-hmm. both ways. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, such, such good things. So um, anything else as far as the integration that you want to talk about? Um, I guess I would just say one thing to think about is just not to, even as we talk about being open to technology, to recognize mm-hmm. when it is distracting. So I do think, oh, I, yes. you know, I've seen kids even with, um, you know, who might have dyslexia, who are reading text that has lots of links on it. You know, it says like, mm. here, click if you want to understand this word or click if you, you know, and there's a lot of research showing that that can be really helpful for certain mm. kids in certain times, but it can mm. also be overwhelming and kind of overstimulating. Yeah. The child is like clicking on the link every time because then they're mm-hmm. you know, being let off into maybe sometimes a rabbit hole of, you know, here's the right. link. So just to be mindful <laughs> of that and kind of know mm-hmm. that is this helping learning or is this kind of creating another situation where they're inattentive or feel unmotivated? That, that would right. be my main takeaway is just to always kind of be checking in with the student. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so many times we think, oh, this is a great add on. And I've never even thought about that is, yes, sometimes those great things can be too much. Exactly. Um, and, and yes, and especially with reading comprehension, the last thing you want is to be going all over the place, right. because the last thing you're going to do is create that picture in your mind, you're going to be yeah, exactly. creating all these sub pictures yeah, right. yes. <laughs> at the same time. Yeah. So yes. Um, so so yes, that those are some that's some great points. And I think technology in a way can be sometimes overly useful. Like we find that, you know, those, those spell checks now that just mm-hmm. instantly correct 
your yeah. spelling before you even see the word um, is not helpful in teaching your child how to spell. <laughs> exactly. And even to recognize which one is spelled right. So sometimes kids will not even know which one's spelled right. So they have these wrong words. <laughs> just, yeah. Yes. So. Yep. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, so yes, technology has gotten so good that it can sometimes be too good to, exactly. to help with yeah, the learning good. process. It's great as an as assistive thing for the necessary us adults that don't spell correctly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All, everything in moderation, I would say. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. So true. But all right. Well, um, we had one person at the very beginning say, great point. I'm not exactly sure what that was for, um, but I'm glad that something that we said really rang true for you. Um, and uh, we had somebody on YouTube ask if we could add subtitles. Um, the subtitles will be added after as a recording. I'm sorry, we don't do those live. Um, I've been looking into ways we could get um, a transcript added instantly. It's just this particular program that I use StreamYard doesn't do that. Um, I've been begging them. So, um, so yes, you'll have to wait for the subtitles on either Facebook or YouTube after the recording's done. So, um, so that's done. But um, hopefully soon we'll be having transcripts come out um, with the recorded version as well, very soon, because I know a lot of you have been asking about that. And um, so, so just answers to a couple of those questions we have. If you have anything else you'd like to add, um, please make a comment in the feed on Facebook or YouTube, and we'd love to get to those. Do you have a student that is um, addicted to technology? How do we get them off of there? Maybe that's a good question that we can um, talk a little bit about. Um, how, do we, um, how do we kind of transition to yes. that addiction to the usefulness of technology? Definitely. So I do think it really all comes back to that question of self-awareness. And it can be hard if a child is really addicted and feels like, oh, I, I need this or I, I you know, can't get off of it. Uh, because we know there's a physical side, too, where it actually can feel addicting. You know, they are yeah. having that surges of dopamine and things when they're mm -hmm. like, oh, this feels really good. So it makes sense that it's going to be hard for them to actually right. get, get off of it. You can't really just say, mm -hmm. okay, well, let's stop. And, you know, um, yeah. Uh -huh. so, um, so but, I think to, but to teach kids like to think about, well, what, what isn't getting done? Let's actually look at the other things so mm -hmm. sometimes rather than focusing on, well, let's look at how many hours you're on technology and talk about that. It can also, it can be right. more effective to actually turn your attention towards all of the other things that need to happen and kind of mm. focus a little bit gently on, well, let's move towards getting those things done or doing more of those right. things and mm -hmm. kind of not, not so much talking about the technology at first. Um, mm -hmm. And then checking in with a child, like, well, how are you feeling about it? Like, what, what do you feel when you're staring at the screen for 10 hours? You know, how does your body mm -hmm. feel? Like, even actually having right. those kind of conversations to help kids feel like, oh, I'm starting to notice signs when I'm getting fatigued or my eyes are getting blurry or, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, that mm -hmm. can also help when we're thinking about sort of health and children's well-being and to say, yeah, yeah it doesn't actually feel good when mm -hmm. you're on technology for that long. Um, so yes, those are kind of ways to start with that, but it's definitely a, a process. So I wouldn't say mm. um, it's a single fix because it involves yeah. conversations. Exactly. And uh, if any type of addiction or just a bad habit, it does take time. And that's a, so it's a good reminder for us as parents that this is just not an overnight thing where we can just say, yes, my child's just going to get off of this. We're going to be done um, because Yes, they, they need to learn the process of how to change mm -hmm. um, and move towards better inputs and t use of their time. And like you said, Rebecca, just being able to to say, what aren't we doing? What How are you feeling? And um, for them to notice that, because I mean, as adults, um, we spend a lot of time on technology, too, and we need to have those skills mm -hmm. as adults and our, so to train our children this, this is what, this is when you should get up and take a break, you know, not just when your watch goes off and says, um, you haven't been, you've been sitting for too long. Right. Um, <laughs> you should just exactly. in, intrinsically know, I need to get up and walk around. This mm -hmm. is, I've just been sitting too long. Um, my, my eyes are starting to, to glaze over and, and not being productive exactly. at all. Yes, <laughs> sitting <we're> here. <laughs> um, so, yeah. 
great, great topics of conversation for sure. Um, so, so yeah, we've covered a lot of points. We've talked about just that the the use of technology and helping our students to to realize different ways that they can um, advocate for using technology, um, but integrating us into that conversation um, about the technology and and maybe some some tough points with with addictions to screens and and other things and so we we've covered a lot of topics is there anything else that um is coming to mind that you'd really like our viewers to know um i mean i guess i would say just now um you know after two years of kids using a lot of screens i Mm. think a lot of people have developed you know habits where they didn't necessarily have them before Um, Oh, yes. So I think it can be a helpful time just to kind of take a reset and to say, oh, well, Mm. let's look at kind of like a technology, you know, sort of assessment. Assessment. Yeah. Yeah. Not just for the kids, but even for us. Like, how are we Mm. using technology and what habits have we maybe gotten into that we'd like to change? And having a a family conversation can be really helpful, too. Um, You know, maybe it's a great idea. Yeah. Just sort of thinking you know, have we all started using our phones at the table, for example, when mm, we mm-hmm. want to do that or all, or, you know, that kind of thing, just to sort of right. notice and say, like, let's maybe set some things if we want to change. Um, mm-hmm. It's be a really good time just because it's natural that after so much um, isolation and so much, you know, mm-hmm. there's been a lot sort of increase and creep up of those things. Yeah. Yeah. So much so since, mm-hmm. since COVID, I know we, exactly. it, it is good to take those assessments. And I think on a regular basis, you know, things just creep in anyways. And so maybe to have a certain time set in your calendar, you know, every couple months or where are we at? Or have we allowed this to creep back in? And Mm -hmm. just doing a family assessment. I love that. Mm -hmm. Um, That's definitely, it can be added to my list. (laughs) I know. (laughs) Even with adult children, you know, it just happens. It does happen. You don't know. Life life just goes and you're Mm -hmm. like, oh man, you know, you get so busy and everybody's schedules and it's like, let's all reconnect. But we, you have to be purposeful in in those things because if we're not, we can easily slide and the way everything you know, is just going towards more and more usage of technology. And we're, we're spending time together, but we're not talking to each other. We're not even looking at one another. Exactly. Um, And and I think also if we're modeling for our children, this is what, this is what we need to do. This is what makes sure we do what's most important Mm -hmm. instead of, well, we're just going to slide with everybody else. (laughs) Yes. Yes. And I think that is so true to think about just your own values, you know, what's working for mm. you as a family and realizing like, well, if that works for this other family, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for our family, you know, to think about yeah. like, how does actually, you know, how can we make this useful for us and actually mm-hmm. fun and, you know, part of our family life without feeling like, oh, this is, you know, we have to be doing this because everybody else is texting at 10 o'clock or everybody else is, you know, whatever else. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and so if you need to set those boundaries, set those boundaries firm, let your children see you setting those boundaries um, because then they're more likely to see that they're valued and they'll follow in doing that too. And that it's important to you and it'll become important to them. So, well, this has been such a great conversation, Rebecca. I would love for you to talk a little bit about your resources and your book, and I'm going to put your your website up. But for those people that are listening on our podcast, um, Rebecca's website is RebeccaRoland.com. It's R-E-B-E-C-C-A-R-O-L-L-A-N-D.com. Definitely. Yeah. So I, um, on my website, I have a free newsletter where you can get different tips, um, points and ask questions and I can respond to, um, you can also find the link to my book. So I actually wrote a book recently called the art of talking with children. And it Mm. does talk about technology use and a lot about motivation. Um, so if you're interested in more of those topics or even just the conversation starters and things like that, um, yeah. there's a large appendix that goes by ages and stages. So, oh, that's really awesome. Helpful. Yeah. So mm-hmm. if you're thinking, well, how do I talk to a two year old versus a 15 year old? Um, yes, yeah, so that's, that's a very different conversation. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> At least you would hope yeah. so. You would hope so. <laughs> yes. Yes. You were definitely not going to be using the same words, uh, hopefully. 
Um, so yeah, so I talk a lot about that and, um, and that's available either through Amazon, through my website or on HarperCollins where I was published. Awesome. Well, that's great. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca. I appreciate all your insight in this and it has definitely taken a different route than than a typical a conversation about educational technology, <laughs> but, I've, yes. but it's been, but it's what we really wanted to focus on um, this month is that technology has a use, but we have to be very mindful of those usages and how we, we integrate that in. So, so thank you for just um, sharing your wisdom in this area and giving our parents um, just some tools to be able yeah. to use. Yes, thank you for having me. This is wonderful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, thank you all for joining us too on this broadcast. Um, again, this broadcast was sponsored by viewers like you. If you'd like to make a donation to SPED Homeschool, um, it was is tax deductible. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. You can visit our website at spedhomeschool.com to do that. Um, and we're going to continue this conversation this month um, about technology. Next week, though, we're not going to be talking about using technology with your kids. We're going to be tech, talking about tech for you. Um, our conversation next week is about um using technology to showcase your students learning and basically creating portfolios of your students work using tech instead of big folders and boxes that you have no place to store in your home. And like when I got to the end of my homeschooling, went, what do I do with all these <laughs> things? Um, it's nice to have some of it, but when you've got just boxes and boxes from 19 years of homeschooling, and moving, it, it doesn't make sense. So our guest next week is gonna talk about how to use tech to really showcase what's most important to keep those memorable things and um, and not let it take up all the space in your house. <laughs> so um, very useful technology. Absolutely. So, um, so you'll want to join us for that. And we'll be back again at our regular time, 1230 Central um, on Tuesday afternoon again for, for that broadcast. So, um, so you'll want to join us then. Um, thank you again, Rebecca. Thank you for the work that you do and um, for all that you do to just um, pour into families and children and educators and um, into the science of education. I appreciate um, you and the work that you do. Well, thank you. Yes, and thanks to everyone listening. Yes, yes. Thank you for our viewers. Um, we appreciate you a lot, um, and we are thankful that you are part of our community. And um, and so we um, will definitely see you again next week. And um, and until then, take care and God bless. And um, have a great week. Bye, everybody. Bye. Are you concerned about tensions in the Middle East? Do you wonder where we're currently at in the biblical timeline? Are we really in the last days? Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Carl Muller with the Inside the Epicenter podcast. Every week, my co-host, best-selling author Joel Rosenberg, and I answer those questions and more. You'll hear inside knowledge of our meetings with leaders at the highest levels of government in the U.S., Israel, and the Middle East equipping you to filter the news with biblically sound insights. Find Inside the Epicenter on your favorite podcast app or go to joshuafun.com to listen and subscribe.